Okay, let's talk about stargazers. That'd be the stargazer tribe and the wealthy apocalypse LARP. This will be the second try at this because, of course, the first time I did it with no sound because Chimera was messing with me and I guess he wanted to see if any true stargazers were out there who could decipher what I was saying from the mime perspective because all you saw was me moving around and moving my lips. Okay, so stargazers tend to be kind of rare and unusual in most games because of the canon genre. In the canon genre, the stargazers have a homeland in Tibet. Well, According to canon, they have lost most of the sacred places in their homeland. When this was happening, they went to the Gru Nation, and they were looking for aid in protecting and in fighting back. Well, the Gru being what they are, were in fighting amongst themselves, and pretty much blew off the Stargazers. Well, the Stargazers weren't having this, so they looked for other allies, namely the Beast Courts of the East. The Beast Courts welcomed them, and the majority of the Stargazers left the nation. They left the nation and they joined over there. Now, that doesn't mean all did, because quite a few, they'll, uh, they stayed true to their Western heritage, to what they had established. A lot of them believed that they needed to be able to fight the enemies over the whole world, rather than just go to the east, where the majority of the tribe was going. So, in organizational play, and we were once part of an organization, in order to make stargazers playable they made the stargazers come back to the nation I didn't agree with this um, however we were kind of roped in by it and uh, it made no sense I mean why the stargazers were a member then they left then they came back it makes them sound flighty it makes them sound weak it it hurts their genre I mean, in my troop, once we left the organization, I pretty much reverted it back to the majority of them have joined the Beast Courts. Therefore, they are rare and unusual in my games. So I'm going to play off that, you know, which is the typical canon that you'll get out of the tribe books and the Laws of the Wild and so on. Well, first off, you got to understand the tribe itself. Um, they're broken into three categories, kind of. They're, they're, I don't want to call them camps because they're not. Um, but there's three factions in there. You have your traditionalists. Uh, your traditionalists, they follow all the old ways. This is where a lot of the Western stargazers uh, fall because they are following the tradition of their ancestors who worked with the Gru Nation. You got the transcendents. Um, the transcendents, uh, they are not something that works well in true play, I think. Um, maybe it's because of the quality of players who usually try to play it. Transcendents reject their group nature. They believe in seeking total inner peace because if they're, if you know everybody did this, their soul, you know, their souls would be so pure there'd be no place for the worm. Then you have your Trappists. Trappists are really interesting, and I think I think this is where we 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 lost an opportunity when we were part of the organization. Uh, we were part of an organization that actually ran a storyline at an event game where they were trying to change the litany. They wanted to add in, we will fight the weaver wherever it dwells and wherever it breeds. Strangely enough, they made the Silent Striders the conveyor of this idea. It didn't make sense, and in the end, everybody with the exception of the Red Talons pretty much voted against it even the stargazers even the actana and we you know and the actana were led by a very anti-weaver type um, character the trappists believe that the true enemy is the queen spider aka the weaver and they are at they consider themselves at war and at war with the weaver so they will be continually going after them that's why I believe these should have been the group that led the Stargazers to initiate the potential plan to change the litany. Everybody kind of falls into one of the three. If you if you don't fall into one of the three, you're probably falling into tradition the, the traditionalist group just because. Then it breaks down into camps. Now the camps, you gotta understand something about the camps. They're kind of odd compared to your normal 
um, your normal tribes. You got the, uh, let's start with the uh, Anaganim, also known as the non-returners. These guys, these guys have like left for the Umbra. They believe that if there is a solution to Gaia's maladies, it's in the Umbra. If there's not, then they need to go into the Umbra to find a new Gaia or find someplace else. Doesn't work very well for troop games. Doesn't work very well in anything but maybe a group of all non-returners. It's, ugh, I don't know. I, I, I'm not a big fan of this camp. Then you got the fake, the sacred thread. The sacred thread are, uh, they believe the guru tend to concern themselves with the guru affairs. However, the sacred thread concerns themselves with mortal affairs. They believe they're like the shepherds of men and women, the humans, the non-regenerative, you know, the non wear types, the non-kinfolk types. They do comprise a large chunk of the Stargazers themselves. Then you've got the Zephyr. This is a martial arm. I mean, they believe in, they're at war. They are at war. They will show up where, when and where needed. Um, they have other equivalents in other, in other tribes. I mean, the, uh, the Glasswalkers have their version. Fianna have their version. I mean, it seems like most tribes have a version of this. Then you get the Trance Runners. They're one of the smaller camps. The Trance Runners, in a lot of ways, feel like uh, they're, they're answer to the Silent Striders. They are the Harbingers. They're the ones who they, they relay messages or they bring information to steps they feel are needed. It's where you see them, but when they do show up... Um, you know, there it's almost always important. Um, every time I think of Middle Earth and uh, the Tolkien genre, I think of when they call uh, Gandalf Mithrander. I always think of uh, him as a trance runner. Then you have the heavenly successors of the Demon Eaters. They're just called the Demon Eaters. They they're demon hunters. Now, what does that mean? Um, there is the obvious one, which is which means that they battle against uh, the creatures from the Demon the Fallen supplement. That's not entirely all-encompassing. Uh, to some, there are demons that, and I say demons, i got to put quotation marks around them, that are indigenous to the laws of the East, um, the Beast Court and such. This is a big camp out that way. <coughs> to others, demons are just evil spirits that have an adverse influence usually on mankind that sounds entirely too much like Banes and Fomori so this camp is kind of a kind of a broad spectrum type deal what it comes down to is what's best for the chronicle you're in and therefore the storytellers will approve exactly what demon means there was the Clay Pook. I believe it's pronounced Clayto Pook. Clayto Pook was considered the greatest of all the stargazers. And there was a group that pretty much followed his dictums. And they always believed that his soul came back and inhabited some, you know, some stargazer of note. And this camp followed that stargazer because they believed that, you know, he was kind of the prophet that would lead them to victory over the worm and the weaver. I believe it was in 1999, the last... I don't know if you're going to say descendant, but the last person who ever got identified with his soul died. and Or vanished. I believe it was he vanished. When he vanished, it seems like the entire camp did as well. So there isn't really one of these camps anymore. And a lot of people are theorizing that uh, it's a sign of the end times. That Clayto Pook is not returned yet because it's saving his, he's saving his power and he's going to return when needed, which means pretty much at the Plains of the Apocalypse. Last camp we're going to talk about is the Ouroboros. The Ouroboros um, went on a mad quest. They went 
pretty much into the abyss, into Malfeas itself. They were basically looking to find and free the worm from the depredations of the weaver, the queen spider. They were successful. A little bit. They believe that they have freed a small, uncorrupted portion of the worm. One that stayed true to its original purpose as a as one of the triad, the forces of balance. The Ouroburns, for the most part, have taken this as their totem. Suffice it to say, having the worm as your totem is not looked upon very kindly by most people. And if the Ouroburns, when, when they're rooted out, or when they're discovered, it almost always leads to fights and challenges, especially from other tribes of the Gru Nation. So those are the camps as they sit, and you're, if you're going to fall into one of those, it kind of dictates your philosophy. The other things dictated are the natural stargazer um, traits, such as their tribal weakness. If a stargazer gets an enigma in front of them that they cannot solve, they go into almost a fugue state as they will sit there and they will work every route out they can to decipher it. This could lead them for days and days and days. <coughs> it's Every stargazer has this problem. So for some, it's it, different types of puzzles are worse. It just depends on how the character is designed. Um, stargazer naming conventions... Uh, Especially I, I, for Western Stargazers, that's what I'll focus on since that's what I primarily play. I don't play the Eastern games very much. Um, they tend to have like kind of a generic first name, you know, David, Peter, Ralph, you name it. And then they usually have an Oriental last name, something usually like from the Chinese or or something. Usually means something. Sometimes they'll just take a first name and they'll have an epithet after it, and. It's kind of like a deed name. Uh, I remember when I read the book, they had examples like Comet Tail and Blessed of Stars. So it does sound like a deed name. How do they get this? It depends on, it really depends on the naming conventions around them. Chinese stargazers, um, if I, they, part of their rite of passage is this like an elaborate naming ritual. And they come out with their name and that's their name. That, that's what they're going to be called for their existence. There's not going to be any change to that. Um, what is it? The Indian and Pakistani stargazers, they're allowed to choose their names within reason, you know, so it's not quite as intricate. When you get to the Western culture, it all re really depends on who they're around because a lot of times a stargazer is going to get named and there might not be other stargazers around. They're going to get named by a Fianna Den parent or something like that. So they might tend to have a very guru style name, you know, Raker of Worm or whatever it may be. Um, couple things you got to consider with stargazers is there's a couple of unique abilities that go along with them. What is stargazing? Obviously, they're kind of named after it. Stargazing is a dual function ability. On one hand, it allows for some navigation amongst like the ethereal realm when they're dealing with celestial bodies. So it, it does have some aid in the umbra, especially the upper umbra, the ethereal realm. The other one is when they're dealing with Enigma's challenges, they can use stargazing to bring in that power. Um, they're looking to the heavens for answers, and it makes the, it makes it easier for them to decode Enigma's. And there's a formula for it, and, but it is very helpful. And it does this does tend to be something they don't really teach outside the tribe. The other ability is called Kylindo. Kylindo is a group martial arts. It focuses on like your typical, you know, it's got like a base in your uh, your old-fashioned karate, kung fu, judo type type mytho or type not mythos type medium. It adds in the guru shape changing abilities, along with um, some alliances with various wind type spirits, which the stargazers have always had some kind of alliances with. It is a very nasty thing. I mean, every time I hear it, I just can't help but, you know, think of, you know, everybody was kung fu fighting. You know, you got to sing it. If you don't sing it, you're not a true Kailindo master. It's very effective. And it's also very hard to run. Now, not every game is going to run it. Because 
the systems that they have in place don't translate over very well to LARP. Um, I designed system a system for it, which was subsequently picked up by the organization we were involved in. So that actually worked fairly well. And since I have the basis and I am the creator, it does run in my game. It's just not something that is spread around all that much because everybody wants it, but not every Stargazer is going to teach it. And those who learned outside it, they don't tend to teach it much because a lot of times there's um, deals made of I'll teach you, but you don't teach anybody else. Uh, lastly, you got to kind of get into the spirits that they're allied with. Obviously, there's Chimera. Chimera is a changeling spirit. It, it changes its ways a lot, and it is a spirit of wisdom. It pretty much, it's, its core belief is that you should always be changing to seek inner balance, inner peace, inner wisdom. You should be deciphering the enigmas and puzzles around you to, to grant this inner wisdom. In that way, Chimera is not a complex spirit, but if you really look at that, those dictums, it gets very, very complex. Obviously, <coughs> there's going to be a lot of spiritual wisdom allied with Chimera. Um, examples, Belstu. Belstu is a spirit of wisdom and gnosis. Uh, kind of looks like an aged old wizard. Uh, kind of reminds me of Gandalf or, or Fizban. You got the Aralin, which they, it's another spirit of wisdom that come across as like... Um, Almost like like ancient priestesses dressed in white robes with golden belts. You've got uh, the Wania Kanke, also known as the Dream Ravens. It's another. It's yet another spirit of wisdom that has its own little niche in there. Um, you've got um, I think Manigua, the Patchwork Wolf. Um, it's spirit of wisdom, loyalty, and courage. It uh. It's also kind of an indestructible spirit because it's believed every time it's destroyed that it patches itself back together in its pocket realm. That does not mean that everything that follows that is wisdom. I mean, um, you got Gembu, the black tortoise, spirit of cunning. Um, can be kind of an interesting spirit in, into itself. Um, you've got Biaku, the white tiger, spirit of war. It's a very niche type spirit because it, it believes that its children have been killed off by the weaver's trappings. Therefore, it demands that its children don't carry weaver tech and usually have to fight the weaver. And respect is one of my favorites is Suzaku the Red Bird. It has a rivalry with Falcon and its followers um, have pretty much a bigger stick stuck up their ass than the Silver Fangs do when it comes to all about leadership and honor and so on. I mean, I think it's banned is that you have to cons consistently increase your social skills. Whether it's your traits, your abilities, whatever, you have to consistently be working on that because that's what the spirit demands. These are very enigmatic spirits, and they're hard. You know, you don't see them a lot in a lot of games because you don't see a lot of star users. Um, they're also very difficult to follow because they're so scalpel's edge. So if you're going to make a Stargazer and you get approval to do so, I mean, not every game is going to make you get approval, mine would. When you make your character, your auspice is going to obviously play a big big part in it. And so will your heritage, where you come from. But you're going to want to focus on, like physicals, you're probably going to want to have dexterity based, you know, maybe some stamina based, but you're going to want to stay away from stuff like brawny, um, tough and so on because a lot of it's about like bending with the wind it's they're very uh, lithe and nimble and flexible their mental should be high because they're constantly trying to you know decipher uh, puzzles of sort socials socials will usually get the shaft however obviously if you're looking to follow Suzaku you better damn well start working on those socials Ability-wise, obviously, um, Kylindo and Stargazer are going to be interesting. Enigma is a must. Um, they do tend to have, you know, like physical base. They're going to they're going to have a lot of dodges, maybe some athletics and acrobatics. Um, sometimes it depends on your your camp. 
Obviously, the trance runners are going to have a lot of movement-based skills and so on. And lore. Lord knows these are lore and linguistics. These are the masters of them. So you should be focusing on a lot of that stuff. Backgrounds-wise, look at pure breed. Um, pure breed's probably one of the best. You know, you're going to see that somewhat in there. So that's always a nice one. You're going to probably look at. Uh, well, obviously they're going to link themselves with totems. Ancestors are going to be huge with them. So base it accordingly. I mean, influence-wise. They might have their own version of church because a lot of them are tied to the Buddhists. Um, others might be tied to other various types like that. University might be big because they're you know masters of uh, scholastics and such. So that's kind of a breakdown on the stargazers. So I'll wrap it at that. Have a good one.